So you guys heard a little bit from Brian about what recap is. Um, and so I'm going to go into a little more detail about that. I'm going to tell you more about Pacer. Um, and I'm going to talk about things we are sort of thinking about for 2.0. And um, I won't have time for questions. But I want to plant a seed in your mind um, with a question that I do have for you guys. And I'm sure at some point we'll have t time to talk about it. Um, so. Um, what is recap? Brian talked about this earlier, but before you can really get into what recap is, you have to understand what PACER is. So PACER is the Public Access to Court Electronic Records System. Um, it is a database that's maintained in about 200 individual locations. They each take the software and the court installs it in its own location, and then they tweak it in their own little way. Um, and so you get these interesting sorts of similar websites, but different. Um, they said recently they have a billion documents. So we think this is the biggest, possibly in the world, probably in the United States, the biggest paywall collection of uh, public domain documents that we know of. It's, it's truly massive. Um, and the cost for these, 10 cents per page, cap at $3 per document. And also search results cost a dime per page. Funny thing about search results, you don't know how big they are until you've paid. So you put in a query, you get back 1,000 results. Well, that's going to be 10 bucks. There's no cap on that. You get back 2,000 results, that's going to be 20 bucks. And you've already paid by the time you see the results. It's, it's done. So be careful what you search for, um, especially if you're playing with it. Because the first thing you do when you play with the system is do a search. You will then be paying. So. Be careful if you leave this lightning talk and decide to play with it, um, as I did. Lehman Brothers, if you want to download everything from that, it, I think it's the biggest one we've ever seen. But just to download everything in that case, $27,000, assuming uh, six pages per item. Um, and it was built in 1997. And it's not really been updated. Um, <laughs> It's really, it looks like this. Here you can see their big warning. Search results from the screen are not subject to the 30 page limit on PACER charges. Be as specific as possible with your search criteria. We're librarians here. We, we know that searching is a matter of going broad and then narrowing. So um, is this really search even? I don't know. But uh, I think my conclusion here is <laughs> it's really bad. Like, it's, it's very bad. So that's our backdrop. Um, and onto that, what we've done, and actually it was started at the Center for Information Technology Policy at Princeton, um, and we're collaborating on it now, is they wrote a couple of browser extensions. Um, originally it was just for Firefox. There's one for Chrome now too. What you do is you install these. You use Pacer as you normally would. Whenever you buy a document, we get a copy. We send it to the Internet Archive. Um, and if anybody's ever looked at the document that you want and you're about to purchase, we'll inject a little icon next to it that says, get it for free. Um, and so we've recapped about three and a half million items so far. Um, and they've been downloaded many, many, many times, um, saving people a lot of money. So that's sort of the backdrop for that. Um, there are some problems. Firefox has changed a lot since it was first created, so the code is now getting to be a little bit old and needs some love. Um, Chrome's been a little bit better. Uh, it only works with Pacer. So the, what, the question I want you guys to think about is, are there other um, repositories of public domain documents that we should be thinking about? Um, already we've identified Alameda County courts. Um, we're, we're in Alameda County, California. Uh, they're even crazier. It's a dollar per page. Um, you can imagine this gets expensive. And this isn't what justice should look like in our opinion. It, uh, it means that people with more money have more access to documents. More access to documents mean that you can do, you have better tools. Better tools mean you have, a better, you have an edge in, in when you come into, uh, into the court. And that's not the way we want to do it. Um, so I've only got five minutes. That's pretty much it. And I'll hand it off to whomever's next.
up is Dragon, Dragon Espensheet from Riz Rhizome. Um, you, know, you can set it up. Hi. I think the setup time opening tabs doesn't count. <laughs> yeah, these long domain names. Oh, it's here already. So, okay, um, these are just three links, and I want to um, point out that at Rhizome, which is a digital arts nonprofit that has been founded 1996 on the web and exists mainly on the web, and we have been dealing with the web since, yeah, since the web, um, with artists and artwork, and so the the main difference I think to the other institutions that. Uh, we're presenting here is that we don't see the web as a medium that points to something, but we see the, the web more as a condition in itself, and it doesn't have content for us, but it's more an activity that people do. Um, and it's also for sure not a continuous publishing space where uh, there is a URL and a time that you access, so there is just no, we don't have this idea of documents. And I want to show it on a very simple example uh, in what direction we are going here. So um, there is an artwork by Jan Robert Leitke, which is called Scroll Bars, Untitled Scroll Bars, which looked like that uh, during the time the screenshot was made, which is here this beautiful Colgate Gale Scroll Bars. Um, but I can look at it now as well, and thanks to to using Microsoft Windows here, which is an operating system that most people have never seen in their lives because they don't work in administration or in... <laughs> no, actually, that's, that's true. I mean, scroll bars are, are already something very exotic, but there is no content here on these pages. There is absolutely nothing here. There's only scroll bars. So, um, so we, uh, this was the first version how it was archived in, in 2000, which is just the artist handed over files to us and we put them on the server. Um, of course, this is very much from the process of how art works, so the artist comes and hands over something. Um, this doesn't work anymore very much, especially since artists move to work on social media most of the time now, and they don't have anything they can hand over anymore. Um, we are using, um, also, uh, we are using, here on our WebInnect server, we are using, um, um, Again, the PyWayback framework that Ilya Kramer has developed, and we are working very closely with him to develop it further, also the web recorder project. So here now, at least we have the original URL part of the thing, of the archive, that, uh, that is very, that is, yeah, the, the, the original URL is also part of the, of the web. But since, uh, since we are, dealing here with a, with a piece that was made in the year 2000, and the, uh, and the scroll bars practically don't exist anymore. We are working here with, together with the University of Freiburg that we just won a major research grant together with them. We integrated here, this is the first step, to integrate web archives with emulation so this is not fully transparent yet, so at the moment the emulator is aware that it needs to connect to another system, but you see here, this is very close to the year 2000 actually, here with this. Um, and of course, because again, the web is not documents anymore. I mean, it may be used to be for a few months after Tim Berners-Lee put it out there, but um, I love how the scroll bars are destroying themselves here. This is just <laughs> beautiful. Um, but the, <clears throat> the thing is that the web is not a document delivery system, kind of. It's a software. It's, it's a software delivery system, and maybe it's even a distributed one software thing. So this is how we are, we are approaching it. And this is also about the access, how, how access is given is, is very crucial here. So at some point, while we have our web archives and many of them are accessible in a meaningful way, meaningful way for a few years, at some point browsers will change or user interface paradigms will change so much that we will need to shift them into emulation, but we are, uh, we are using a very soft going from actual browser to emulated browser. So it can, it can travel. And 
Now let me quickly point you to, I will leave this wobbling in this window. <clears throat> and when it comes, um, uh, what we are very interested in as an artistic organization, uh, we are very interested in, in high fidelity web captures, which means like that, for example, we can, uh, this is a, a website of a Berlin gallery that uses loads of Vimeo embeds and background videos and everything. We did archive that just by looking at it with web recorder, um, which is the tool that Ilya Kramer developed and we, we, we did a lot of development together. Um, so let me quickly show you what is possible there just as a uh, quick, uh, I'm, of course I'm a web recorder user and everybody who is serious about web archiving should have a beta account there. Uh, let me show you here this tweet by Edward Balls, a member of, ex-member of British Parliament, which is one of the famous weird politician tweets in the history of social media. He just tweeted at Balls and it got really popular. <laughs> but, but not... Uh, more than a year later, so this was tweeted in 2011 and 2012, this gentleman picked it up and made it famous. Mm -hmm. and, um, but the thing is here, you see I'm logged in here into this archived version. I'm logged in because otherwise, if I wouldn't be logged in, I wouldn't be able to read the thousands and thousands of answers that are attached to this tweet. And here at that point when I archived it, six notifications were waiting for me. Um, and yeah, tomorrow in the session Beyond Crawling, I will demonstrate in detail how that goes, how that works. But yeah, so this is a, you see also, yeah, it's, it's loading here. But not, not a single bit is actually coming from the Twitter servers here. And of course the, where is it? Here, Rhizome's Facebook page. I also logged in here as I don't have a Facebook account, so this is a fake account here. But uh, at, we are also able to log into Facebook and then start archiving it, by, but just from looking at it. So everything that I did was to paste the Facebook URL in here that I want, and then I start scrolling down, and everything that I see automatically goes through the walk. All right, and details on that tomorrow. Thank you. I will read that. Very cool. All right. Jefferson, do you want to do a lightning talk for five, five, five minutes? On the, let's see. You did? <laughs> we could, you said you would improvise it, as I recall. Uh, Thanks. Um, I'm not prepared, but I was going to talk about um, a new project that we've been working on. So I'm from Internet Archive, um, and I was going to talk about uh, research services. So I think uh, some people in the room are going to... Uh, 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 to, so next week uh, is Resaw, a conference in Denmark that will be a lot of uh, researchers. And we have been working on providing research services uh, in Internet Archive in a couple of ways. And I'll talk about uh, first the background and then these and walk through it. So our goal, um, we generally in the past have worked mostly on large data set uh, research services with web scientists, uh, with computer science scientists and other sort of big research initiatives. Um, that have their own infrastructure as far as compute clusters to deal with the size of data that we're giving them, which is usually somewhere between 50 and 200 terabytes or something like that. Um, so, you know, I think when we're talking about collection building a lot here and collaborations, it's not just across uh, curatorial efforts, but it's also across access methods. And um, I think web archiving has been very URL-centric in its access methods. and so. We're trying to figure out ways, and I think all of the community is trying to figure out ways to enable access methods that are not entirely URL-centric and that can support data mining and digital humanities uh, and other and similar uh, efforts uh, using 
large, large collections. Um, even small Archivit collections are, you know, multiple terabytes. Uh, and obviously our, our own collection is, is many petabytes. Um, and that is challenging in many ways for the types of research that data-driven uh, scholarship is interested in doing. So um, what are access models that have been successful or not been successful in this area? Um, we've tried giving people data and letting them run on their own cluster. That is sometimes successful, but the research outputs are not necessarily scalable to the larger community. Um, another method that we've tried is giving people access to shared clusters, um, sort of uh, something like Amazon AWS or similar Hadoop in the cloud, giving people free accounts and putting data in there for them to play with there uh, so that compute costs uh, are actually subsidized by us or by a third party, um, but they can still work uh, at scale without having their own infrastructure. So that one is successful but needs a lot of hand-holding. Um, it requires pretty good uh, tech chops and programming or uh, comp sci postdocs working for you. Um, so successful in that it doesn't require the actual hardware, but not successful in that it requires a lot of hand-holding generally um, on our part or by data engineers that are somehow affiliated with the project. Um, so a new one that we've tried is we do all the processing and give people derivative data sets that would then uh, power their research and allow them to do the type of text mining, network analysis, uh, and other sort of um, easy to do, big scale analysis, scholarship, inquiry kind of questions, but using data sets that are derived from the entirety of a collection and so then do not present challenges of processing scale or uh, you know, needing specific uh, programming expertise. So this is it, we've launched it. Uh, we started with Archivit because the collections themselves are smaller, so this is something that would hopefully eventually be rolled out in some shape or form to uh, Internet Archive more broadly with the web collection, um, which is, you know, 10 to 15 petabytes or something like that. Um, but Archivit collections are generally, A, they're curated, they have lots of metadata, um, curator supplied metadata, they crawl at great periodicity, so crawl frequency is much easier to predict than with our global crawls. Uh, which tend to happen for a long period of time. Um, they sort of happen regularly, but not super regularly. We get donations of web data from other sources that are not our crawling. Um, so Archivit provides a good platform for giving, uh, specific, starting with specific collections that are pretty well contained and then doing derivations out of there. So the three uh, that we've started with, and some of these we've been using internally for crawl prioritization, collection QA, um, and we just use it on the back end for many different things. Um, and there are watts, LGAs, and wanes, and what those mean. And I don't have time and didn't prepare like the great visualizations that we've done internally, but we'll put them online. And we'll also be putting up tutorials as well as sample data sets from some public collections that we create internally, so it's not anybody's data um, that we have to give away. So we'll be putting up both uh, works as well as derivative data sets as well as tutorials and walks throughs that go all the way from the raw data to visualization and analysis and, um, and network graphs and stuff like that. So the three that we started with as the pilot project are Watts, LGA, and Wayne. So Watt is basically a uh, sort of key metadata elements from the work. So uh, enough to do text mining like page title and anchor text and meta text and stuff like that. Um, also has provenance data, so all the capture data for the resource is included. Uh, and then all inbound and outbound links as well. So there's linking behavior, text, and uh, capture information. Graph information is basically collection level, and that is every resource that links to every resource across an entire Archivit collection. Uh, so it's just a big composite file of linking behavior that you can do network analysis and things like that. Uh, and these all, of course, have timestamps and things like that, so you can do them longitudinally. Um, and then name entity extraction is one I'm excited about. So it's Stanford name entity uh, NER software uh, run across an entirety of a web collection, and it just extracts all the names, people, places, organizations, ties them to URIs and gives them a timestamp. Um, so what we've been doing after sort of starting with these, and there's plenty of other data sets in the works, is doing things like putting them in their own search engines. Um, Elasticsearch is one we've been using, the whole ELK stack. So you'd be able to do actual um, 
you know, text searching within the collections, but then also sort of faceting on the fly for document discovery, trend analysis. Um, it comes with its own sort of visualization platform, so you can build, you know, charts and graphs and things like that, uh, all within the web browser. So that's research services, trying to figure out how to provide more access to web archives writ large. So, thanks. Thanks, Jefferson. And Jefferson is, uh, as you may, may, be, may or may not be aware, is facilitating a session tomorrow on uh, analysis of data services, so analysis of, of web archive data. So if you have any follow-up conversation you'd like to have with him about anything he just mentioned, uh, I encourage you to go to that tomorrow. So we have, uh, now we have Dan Chudnoff for one more lightning talk, and then after that we'll have Jack, and then we'll be moving on to our next session. Thank you. I'm gonna be as, so I type here and look there, sorry. Uh, I'm gonna be as quick as I can because I'm really excited to hear Jimmy and, and Ian and I don't wanna cut into their time. Uh, to present. Okay, uh, so I'm Dan Chodnoff from George Washington University Libraries in Washington, D.C. Laura Rubel, who had intended to come since her regrets, she couldn't make it. Uh, so I get to stand here and, and let you wonder about this for a moment. I want to tell you about a project we've been working on for almost four years called Social Feed Manager. Uh, if you search for Social Feed Manager, you should find it up at the top of the results on any uh, particular search engine you try. Uh, this is a tool we developed in response to specific researcher needs to work with uh, uh, social media data. We found social scientists on campus doing really interesting studies, but they were managing data by hand, literally assigning students copying and pasting tweets into Excel. So we automated that and uh, found that there are other people on campus doing that uh, and have had some success with the project. So I want to tell you some of the successes we've had, what we're working on right now, and some things we'd like to do next uh, after we get through that next phase. because I'm hoping some of you might be interested in some of those things too. So for the last three years, like I said, we've been collecting data for a lot of different faculty members uh, and uh, graduate students, PhD students, seniors, juniors doing capstone projects master students and freshmen. We just had uh, a fresh, uh, a senior uh, win an undergraduate research prize uh, working on, with Twitter data. We've had uh, master students in political science studying how ISIS is using Twitter and writing reports to the State Department regularly. We've had multiple faculty members just publish papers, chapters and books, that sort of thing. Uh, we collected, for example, all of the tweets from the major party candidates in every midterm uh, congressional race last year and the full election, and they studied those to look at the use of uh, gender references and language and how those campaigns expressed uh, their opinions. So it's, it's run largely social sciences sort of spectrum, uh, but we found uh, it's this great outreach technique and a great way to deliver the service we've always delivered in libraries, which is helping people get going with their research by delivering information to them. Three years ago, our good friend Mark Phillips said, hey Dan, you guys should write an IMLS grant because I want to use your software and uh, you know, you'll need to package it up more. So, so IMLS will probably fund you to package it up. So we wrote a grant and we got funded. Thank you, IMLS. Thank you, Mark. Um, and there's at least, I think, three people in the room that are running SFM now. It's free software under an MIT style license. You can have it. Uh, you can use it. Please give it a shot and tell us what you think. Um, the IMLS Money helped us uh, improve it and document it. We are currently working under a grant from the NHPRC uh, that is focused in three areas, um, and we're very busy with all of those right now. Number one is to expand the scope of the software to be a little more thoughtfully put together and to handle multiple platforms. We're going to have Twitter, Tumblr, and Flickr support, as well as a new grant we've just been funded uh, where we've partnered with Johns Hopkins uh, to collect Chinese uh, blogging materials on Chinese anti-corruption campaign uh, using Archive-It for weblogs and SFM for Weibo. Uh, Weibo, as I mentioned, uh, is sort of like Chinese Twitter. If you've never used Chinese microblogging, it doesn't look like this. What this is is a visualization of a year and a half's worth of data I collected for a social science, a political scientist, a PhD student who is studying um, well, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty subtle, I can't do his work justice, but this is a visualization of a summary of something like 300 million Weibo uh, records I collected for him. Uh, so we, it's nice to have some Weibo experience. Um, 
So we're improving the platform to be multi-target. Multi we're also making it much more self-service. Previously, you kind of had to have one of us librarians pull some levers for you. We want researchers to be able to define their own sets, save it, push a button, have the system go capture stuff for them almost on their own. And finally, uh, probably the more important thing we're working on right now, the most important thing relative to our comments, our keynote speaker's comments this morning, we have a lawyer working with us, analyzing from a policy perspective, working with our archivist who's also looking at collection development policy, description, um, appraisal, processing strategies. And we're gonna go to our general counsel's office to make sure we're on good footing uh, legally with what we're doing. We think we are, and I don't have time to talk about that. And it's 201, so let me just finish by saying we want to move into three new areas. One is figuring out how to present this stuff. When you have a billion things, what sort of interface do you provide? Uh, a second thing is to do analytics and study what's in the data, maybe provide some of that to our social scientists, researchers to sort of further move them along in their work uh, so they can focus even more in on their methods so they can ask questions uh, very thoughtfully. Uh, and finally, to, um, to understand how to document the now, to use a phrase from my colleague Burgess Jules, who's at UC Riverside, how to understand something like a, a political movement that's alive, that's on the streams, that's happening, that's developing. What do you collect? How do you figure out dynamically what to go out and grab? What keywords are arising? What people are becoming leaders? And whose material should you collect? I think that's what we're going to try and move into in the next year. So if that sounds interesting to you, please come find me. Uh, but that's enough time. Thank you. So I promised I would only take one minute for this, so let's see if that's possible. Uh, I'm working on a project that I would love input on. It's an org. Uh, here at toolsfortimetravel.org, which is about building. Really, that's not a thing? All right, I'm already failing at one minute. I'm going to go backwards in time one minute and start now. <laughs> Uh, I'm working on a project to build strong dark archives, which are archives that are jurisdictionally distributed and encrypted so that the uh, archivists themselves cannot read the material until the release conditions are met. These are designed to store culturally valuable materials that will otherwise be deleted or never s shared in the first place if they can't be protected this way. So stories from the troubles in Northern Ireland, which the Belfast Project ran into problems with, Hillary Clinton's emails, stories from cultural conflict around the world. The stuff that we're losing now, maybe we could keep if we could offer strong enough protection for. Uh, I'm having a, a conversation, a small workshop on June 18th at Harvard with a bunch of people who have really interesting thoughts about that. If you look at this and uh, this lights your eyes up, I would love to talk with you about it, and I'd love to uh, have you at our workshop. So come find me. Thanks.